Well, are you ready for today? All right, take your Bibles. Let's go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Because I really believe that God's going to touch somebody today. I believe God's going to encourage somebody today. I believe that somebody today is going to leave here where they, were, they, where they felt weak when they came into this place, but when they leave here today, they're going to feel empowered by the power and the Spirit of God. If you'll believe that with me, say amen. amen. So that's what I'm believing for today, and because we're in a battle. I said, we are in a fight. Well, no wonder you all look the way you do. You don't know you're in a fight. <laughs> you know, we, we, this weekend we celebrate the Declaration of Independence the, the, where we declared that we were going to be a country and to break off from the bonds of, of Great Britain. And so they made the Declaration, the Declaration of Independence as, as we know it. But let me tell you, when they made that Declaration, a fight started. Great Britain said, oh, no, you don't. And the fight was on. When you get ready to make a declaration of your liberty, I'll tell you right now, the devil ain't going to take it sitting down. And when you begin to talk about what you're going to do for God and what you're going to do in the kingdom of God and how you're going to be used by God, the devil going to say, oh, no, you don't. And there is a fight. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness. I'm going to say it one more time and see if you're awake now. We are in a fight. We are in a battle that is going on. Now, again, we're not fighting people. We're fighting against the principalities of darkness. Now, there are all different types of fighters. All different types of fighters. You know, there's, there's girl fighting. I know. I heard the women say, I'll whoop you any day, guy. And there's probably some women that could do that. I'll just say that right now. Now, I, now I, I, I know, looking at me, you would think that I was just a great fighter with this great physical physique that I had. Yeah, God, God bless you. Help your eyesight. Uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got that furniture disease. My chest has fallen into my drawers. Uh, some of y'all get that tomorrow. So, I, <laughs> wasn't that good? Some of y'all suffering from the same disease. Okay, anyway, um, when I was, I think I've told some of y'all this story, but when I was in junior high, I had a good friend of mine. His name was H.G. That was his name. He didn't have a name, just initials. I guess his folks were poor and couldn't afford a whole name. They could only afford two initials. But that was his name, H.G., H.G. Poole, matter of fact. His dad was a, uh, was a border patrol agent, and uh, so H was my, was my great friend, and, and we ran around long together and, and, and had a good time in junior high. And, and one day, we, we just kind of got upset and mad at each other over something, and we just decided we'd have a fight. We'd never been in a fight. We thought we'd just have a real knockdown, drag-out fight. And neither one of us, we both, you know, weighed about 100 pounds soaking wet. We didn't have enough weight behind us to hurt anybody. Man, we're, and we, we sat there, I think, for 30 minutes trying to whoop each other. And finally, we just gave up and said, hey, let's go get a Coke. Let's go do that. This ain't working. And so you got, the, and then you got people who really know how to fight. You know, we watch these ultimate fighters and, and, and cage fighting. I mean, now those people, they, they know how to fight, and they're, they're in it to win it. And they're, they, they understand that. Well, you've got to take a look at yourself and say, what kind of a spiritual fighter am I? Well, what type of a spiritual fighter am I when it comes to this battle, this spiritual warfare, this good fight of faith that we fight? What, what kind of a warrior am I? Well, I want to show you an example of one in the Bible that I, I think God would have us all to be, and you, you'll find that in 2 Samuel chapter number 23. Now, if you read the whole book or the whole chapter there, we'll read the whole book, but read the whole chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 23, and it's a great listing of all of David's homeboys. Literally, if you read that, you'll find this is, da this is David's gang. This is the guys that he brought close to him. These are the ones that he trusted. These are the ones that he entrusted his life to. These were soldiers that were around him. These were men that he, he, got, he got wisdom from and he got counsel from. But he mentions one of these that I want to introduce you to, and it's a valiant fighter by the name of Beniah. Everybody say Beniah. Verse number 20. Let's read there. Beniah, son of Jediah, a valiant fighter. Everybody say valiant fighter. 
That wasn't everybody. Everybody say valiant fighter. From Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian, although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now, Benaiah, if you read more of that, there's several other accounts in Chronicles and, and, and others that, that talk about the relationship that David had with Benaiah. He was one of the top five soldiers in Israel. He was a commander, a general, if you will. He had basically underneath him some, some 24,000 troops. So he's one of the top guys that is up there. He was the captain of David's bodyguards. So though that entrusted group that was around David to protect the king, he was the captain of that. And as a matter of fact, he was the one that would train the most elite. So this is the type of man that he was. This is the entrustment that he had. And that's why they say that he was a valiant fighter. Now the word valiant talks about possessing or showing courage or determination. In other words, it speaks of, of being strong. It speaks of strength. Not, not just physical strength, but, but moral strength. He, he wasn't weak. It talks about courage, that he wasn't afraid, a determination that he would not give up, but he would keep on keeping on until the job was over. So when it says of him there, again in verse 20, that he performed great exploits. Why? Because he was a valiant fighter. There's three things that it says that Benaiah did in this passage that I think show us what we need also to have within our life. Because I'll be honest with you, I think that many times we have become too passive when it comes to spiritual warfare. We have just set back and allowed the enemy to get away with way too much. Come on, I'm going I'm to get militant today, folks. You're going to have to help me here just a little bit. I'm seeing what he is doing in our country. I see what he is doing in our city. I see what he is doing in the lives of individuals. And I'm telling you, there's got to come a point in our life that we stand up and say, God, make me a valiant fighter. We are in a fight. He said, fight the good fight of faith. That we wrestle not. These, these are terminologies of warfare. These are terminologies of, of close combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And many of us don't want to deal with the devil, so we just stay away from him. But when we stay away from him, he is continuing to do destruction in the lives of those that are around us. It's time that the church get on the offense, that we move forward, and we push back the gates of hell and quit setting back and say, well, if he messes with me, I'll mess with him. No, he's messing with us, we got to rise up and be the army of God that pushes back again the gates of hell. Now, to do that, we've got to have valiant fighters. We've got to have men and women of God that are willing to have a backbone and stand up to the antics of the devil, to be willing to stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to take it any longer. And so here's three things that Benaiah did that I believe God wants us to do in a spiritual sin. It says, first of all, that he struck down Moab's two, everybody say two, two mightiest warriors. Now, Moab, they were a group of, of fighters that they had a reputation for that. And he says, these are the two mightiest warriors. Now, two against one, two of the mightiest against one. And Benaiah was willing to go against him. Here's the thing you need to write down. Number one, you've got to be willing to go against the odds. You would think the odds were against him. you got two, two of the mightiest guys that are going against one guy. Where would you put your money? Oh, I'm putting them on the two. No, and Benaiah says you would have lost your bet because I'm a valiant fighter. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to turn around. And I am willing to go against the odds. We've got to be willing to get out of our safety zone. If we play it safe all the time, we've been playing it safe too long. We've been not taking chances. You look at Peter when he was in the boat. Peter got out of the boat when everybody else stayed in the boat. And the only one who walked on the water was the guy who took the chance and went against the odds. 
Oh, come on, somebody help me right now. God's going to challenge you to do things that everybody else is going to say, that's crazy. You can't do that. You're not going to be able to share your faith to them. You're not going to see a miracle happen there. You're not going to see that situation turn around. You're never going to be able to do that. And I just say to them, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I'm going to go against the odds. Because I know who is on my side. I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to do the extra thing that I need to do. It's the second punch. You know, there's a phrase in football, yards after contact. And that's when a runner's got the ball and he's running and that first contact hits. And if he continues on, they mark that spot and they'll give him yards after contact. How much further he went on down the road after he had been hit. Too many times we get hit and we just fall back. We're like LeBron James on the basketball court. But anyway, that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> shots fired, shots fired. I mean, we just, we just, we just, oh, I got hit. I'm telling you, now is the time for us to get up. The devil's going to take his shot at you. I said, the devil's going to take his shot at you. And you're going to have to keep on going after that. Go the second mile when everybody says, oh, that should have knocked them down. No, I'm going against the odds. That should have done you in. No, I'm going against the odds. I'm going against those who are betting against me. Those don't think I can do it. Those don't think I'm going to make it. Those that are counting me out. I don't care if there's one of them or two of them or three of them or four of them. I am going to go against the odds. I am a valiant warrior. Some of you all have to get up after the LeBron shot, the LeBron James shot. I just, I realized that. Here's the second thing that he did. It said he also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Now, first of all, I would not want to go into against a lion any day. Best circumstances, whatever the case may be, I wouldn't want to do that. But now think about the scene that is painted here for us. You got a pit, because many times they would try to trap lions by digging pits, and those lions would fall into those pits. Now, the whole purpose of the pit was that once the lion got in it, or whatever game you were trying to catch, is that it was so slick on the sides, you couldn't get out, thus the trap. So here, Benaiah is willing on a snowy day. So now imagine all the snow and the ice that's on the perimeter of that, uh, of that pit that he's into. It's going to even be more difficult. My point is simply this. He's getting down into it knowing that the only way he's going to get out is he's going to have to kill that lion. But he, he, he's willing not only to go against the odds, but he is willing to face his fear. Because somebody say, you can't get down there. What, are you crazy getting down in that pit? You can't do that. And many times we allow fear to be the thing that overcomes us. Benaiah was willing to get down in there knowing that he had to be victorious in the situation. I don't know what you're afraid of. It, it may be heights. How many are afraid of heights? How many are afraid of snakes? Oh, good. Not too many of you are. That's great. We've released some snakes in here today, though. If you feel something slide by your feet, just reach down and pick it up because obviously you're not afraid of those. Mice? Oh, you bunch of wimps. You weren't afraid of snakes, but you're afraid of mice? How many have ever heard of anybody dying from a mice bite? I mean, really? Have you ever really heard of that? <laughs> it's amazing what we're afraid of. My wife's afraid of geckos. We've got, we've got little geckos at the house. And I said, leave them geckos alone. They're killing spiders and they're killing bugs and everything. She thinks this gecko, every time she tells me about this gecko, it's like some of y'all going fishing. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I've already heard the stories of the fishing trip yesterday. Oh, I caught one that was this big. And let me just tell you, pictures don't lie, folks. Pictures just don't lie. And I saw the postings. How many, how many of you are afraid of, uh, of closed-in spaces? How many of you are afraid of, uh, of oh, here's, here's probably the number one thing people are afraid of. How many are afraid of public speaking? Really? Afraid of public? Stand and explain that to us. Oh, no. <laughs> We've all got these things that we're afraid of. 
I'm not getting down in that pit. I'm not getting down there in that line. I'm not going to do that. There has to come a time in our life that we're willing to face our fear. Where faith is this thing that energizes us and empowers us in the kingdom of God, fear is the tactic of the enemy to stop you from moving forward. You're afraid to share your faith? Afraid to witness to somebody? Afraid even to invite somebody to church? Some of you are afraid to give. Well, and all that's going on, I'm, I'm afraid if I give, I won't back. It, it, it's just fear. Some of you are afraid of obeying the, the, the call of God on your life. Of, I know I should be involved in that. I know I need to be doing that. I know that. But I'm just afraid if I do. I'm afraid to meet new people. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. I'm telling you today, you've got to face your fears if you're going to be a valiant warrior. If you're going to see the enemy defeated in your life, yes, you're going to have those fears. There's nothing wrong with having fear as long as you don't let your fear control you or let your fear have you. When you get knocked off, you get right back up. You say, devil, I know that hurt when I fell off that time, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to do it again. I'm going to face my fear because the longer you stay off, you know, I, I, I grew up with horses and I remember one time when I was just a small kid, my dad had me up on a horse, and I was riding it, and, and we were riding in the backyard and uh, bleeding around, and something spooked the horse, and the horse jumped sideways. Horse can jump sideways, and it just, I fell right off. It didn't buck me off. I fell off. I wasn't hanging on, and I fell off. And boy, I can remember, I ain't getting back up on that. And dad said, no, you're going to get back up on it. You're going to get back up on it right now. You're going to face your fear, because the longer you stay off that horse, the bigger the fear is going to grow in you. Oh, come on. I'm helping somebody. Some of you had things that have happened in your life that has caused fear in your life, and you've, you've sat there, and you've sat there, and that thing has grown bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, where it is more, enti- uh, more intimidating to keep you from moving forward. You have got to face your fear. You've got to get down into that pit. You've got to say, devil, you are not going to keep me from doing what God would have me to do. I'm going to overcome this situation. And many times you've got to humble yourself. You've got to go down before you can get back up. And so, number one, you've got to recognize, you've got to go against the odds. Number two, you've got to face your fears. And let me just give you one more thing. Here's the third thing that it says that he did in verse 21. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but I went against him with a club. Now, again, there's against the odds. A guy with a long spear and a guy with a club, you would think the guy with the spear has the advantage, especially a huge Egyptian. He went against the odds there. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. You've got to be willing to go against the odds. You've got to face your fears. And thirdly, you've got to turn the table on the enemy. Oh, now let me just, let me just help you here just a little bit today. You've got to turn the table on the enemy. See, the spear could have been the thing that would have intimidated Beniah. Obviously, he got the big spear. That would have been intimidating. But what did he do? Instead of the thing that he thought was going to destroy him, that was going to kill him, he took control of that spear. See, some of y'all have got some things in your life that you think the devil is going to destroy you with. And he may have tried to destroy you with it. He may have been the thing that that was the thing that was going to take you out. But you said, no, devil, I'm going to turn the tables on you. I'm going to, I'm going to flip the script on you. And that thing that you meant to destroy me with, no, I'm going to take it and I'm going to use it to kill you with. Oh, come on, somebody help me. Now you, now you know where I'm going with this. Some of you have had situations and problems and difficulties and challenges and failures in your life that you said, oh, no, I'm defeated. I'm never going to be able to get through this thing. I'm never going to be able to use of God. This thing is going to kill me. This thing is going to destroy me. I'm telling you, it's time you stand up and snap. Snatch the spear out of the devil's hand and say, devil, what you meant for bad, God's going to turn around for good, and I am going to run you through with it. Turn your test into a testimony. Turn your mess into a message and use it. The problems that you've gone through, the difficulties that you've gone through, you've gone through them. I'm going to say it again. The problems you face, the problems and difficulties that you've gone through, you have gone through them. 
Why don't you turn around and help somebody else go through them? You know which way to walk. You know how to maneuver through that problem because you've been through that problem. I don't care what that problem is. It may be marital problems. It may be drug addiction. It may be pornography. It may be homosexuality. I don't care what the problem is, what the difficulty. It may be depression. It may be, it may be a codependency. I don't care what it is. You've made your way through it. How many have made your way through something? Then my goodness, take the spear and turn around, kill the devil, and help somebody. Somebody else get through it. That's what a valiant warrior does. Oh, I'm on to preach now. Glad I got my tennis shoes on. Because see what, what happens is, oh, I got through it. I got through it. Oh, man. Oh, I, I'm so glad I got through that. And God says, okay, now go back in it. Cindy and I watched one of our most funniest movies the other day. It's probably not that funny, but it was back in the 70s, and that's when everything was a lot funnier than it is today. It was a Neil Simon movie uh, called Murder by Death. Hilarious, hilarious. And so there's one scene in it. They got all these old uh, murder mystery guys. Uh, Peter Falk plays uh, uh, not Sam Spade, but Sam Diamond. And uh, anyway, I don't go into the movie. But there's one scene, Charlie, Charlie Chan, not Charlie Chan, yeah, uh, yeah, that he's playing, you know, the Chinese uh, investing. Well, Charlie Chan, is that who it was? Huh? Chan, whatever. Anyway, the, you know, I used to love to watch those old movies. Those, those are great. I love the old, but anyway, so he's got his son. They're going across this old bridge. And the bridge looks like it's crooked. It's not going to make it. So, so they stop the car, and he gets out, and it's his, it's his, his son. He says, all right, son, I'm going to get out. You drive the car across, and let's see if it'll make it across the bridge. <laughs> and isn't that what we have children for? Come on, Mom and Dad. Isn't that what we have children for? So he drives that thing across, crack, crack, and the bridge is given, and it's back and forth. And, and he gets to the other side, and the son gets out. Dad, Dad, I made it. It held. Come on over. And dad says, no, drive back over here and get me. You got to be willing to drive back through what you've been through to help somebody else get through. Oh, come on. Somebody help me right now. You got to get to that point that you're willing to go against the odds. You got to face your fears and get down into that pit. And then you've got to be willing to say, I don't care what the odds are. I am going to flip the script. I am going to turn this thing against the devil. I'm going to turn the table on him. See, when you went through that problem and that challenge, you thought it was there to defeat you. And that's what the devil thought. And God says, no, what he meant for bad, you watch me. I'm going to turn it around for your good. Now, that's where that scripture comes from is the story of Joseph. When Joseph had been thrown in, in, into a pit and left for dead, when he had been sold into slavery, into Potiphar's house, when he had been thrown into, into prison, and all these bad things, and all of that led up that he could be presented before Pharaoh to present a plan that would not only deliver Egypt, but would deliver his entire lineage, his entire family. I know you can't see it right now, but if you'll be a valiant fighter, if you will not give up, if you will keep keeping on, if you'll face your fears, if you'll go against the odds, he'll, God will show you how to turn this thing on the devil, and you'll turn out the victory, and the enemy will turn out defeat. You can kill that Egyptian. So let me, let me conclude this thing. You've got to go against the odds, face your fears, turn the table. What was the result? Verse 20, he performed great exploits. It wasn't just those three things that he performed. And friends, if you will be that valiant warrior, that valiant fighter, God's got something he wants to do through you to help others. Everything that Benaiah did was not for himself alone. It was for those that were around him. Come on back, worship team. What kind of fighter are you? What kind of a fighter are you? What battles do you need to fight that you've set back and allowed the enemy? Well, you know, the odds are against me. I can't beat that. 
I'm afraid of that situation. I'm not going to be able to. No, I, I, I've been so damaged that I'm not going to be able to overcome that, that problem, that situation. That spear is too long and too sharp, and all I got is this club. Let me tell you, God wants to give you victory in that situation. God wants to give you victory in that situation. But you've got to speak the name of Jesus. I want you to stand with me all over this place. Because here's, here's really what I'm sensing today. Here's what I really believe, that God is wanting to, in this summertime where people say, I'm taking the summer off. God says, I don't take no time off. I guarantee you the devil don't take no time off. It's in the summertime that he is going to be the most active in so many different ways. And I'm saying it's time for the army of God to arise. It's time for the army of God to say, I'll be a valiant fighter. I'll go against the odds. I'll face my fears. I'll, I'll, I'll turn the tables on the devil. And some of you are facing problems and difficulty. I want to speak the name of Jesus. Some of you are facing some problems and difficulties in your life right now that, that really you feel, the, you feel the giant, the Egyptian, the two Moabs. You hear the roar of the lion. But I want you to know today we're going to speak the name of Jesus. It may be in a problem and a difficulty that you're facing, a fear that you have. But I'm going to pray. Bow your heads with me all over this place. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for the spirit of Benaiah. I pray that a valiant warrior spirit will arise. There are mamas that have been praying for their kids out here. There's daddies that have been praying for their kids. There's, there's spouses that have been praying for their spouses. There, there's those that have been praying through a health problem, a difficulty, a situation, a financial problem. Lord, there are those that are crying out for their lost loved ones. Lord, you see the battles that are before them. God, give us the spirit of Benaiah. Give us a valiant spirit that we are not giving up. We are not turning back. We are not sitting down because we recognize your power that is within us. And God, I speak today to those that are here that are in those situations that the enemy has tried to stop, has tried to weaken, has tried to get them to, to turn around that today, Jesus, is going to be the day that they come against those situations. And that, that valiant spirit begins to arise within them. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want, I just, I just want you to signal to God that I, I'm going to be that. Maybe you're going through a problem of difficulty. You just say, Pastor, I need that valiant spirit with me today. I, I want to be like Ben. I, I'm, I'm facing a situation problem. I, I need to turn the odds. I, I need to turn the table. I need to go. I need fear to be gone in my life. I want to be that valiant fighter that Beniah was. I want to see the enemy defeated in my life and the life of those around me. If that's you, just slip your hand up right now. Slip your hand up right now. Don't be afraid to slip your hand up. Now I want you to do one more thing for me. They're going to sing, speak the name of Jesus. We're going to give the devil high blood pressure. He's going to have to take an Excedrin by the time this service is over. But I want him to see valiant warriors that are willing to say, I am going to fight this. You raise your hand and say, I want that in my life. I need that in life. I want you to take a step out of the aisle that you're in and step to the nearest one. And I want you to join me down here. And we're going to pray. And I believe God's going to raise up valiant warriors. Come on. Come on right now. Speak the name of Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from Who's willing to get down in the pit with him? Who's willing to go against him even though you just got a club? Who's willing to go against him even though there's two and the odds are against you? In the name of Jesus. Oh, come on. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you mean it. Declare it in this place. Jesus for my family. Jesus, 
the devil know that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. I want you to think of that problem, that difficulty, that situation. I want you to look at those two Moabites. I want you to look at that huge Egyptian. I want you to look at that lion that's down in that pit and say, I don't care how scary you may look. I don't care what the doctor has told me. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care how mean they may have been. I know that the power of God is in me. I am not giving up and I am going to fight this battle because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You've got to get a valiant spirit about you that you are not turning around. God, give us, give us courage. Give us strength. Give us the power to overcome in every situation. So lift your hands all over this place and let's just begin to lift up the power of praise in the name of Jesus. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we do it. Not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of God in this place. By the spirit of God in this place by the Spirit of God that's in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty Jesus name of Jesus. She cut up on the rabble, Satara, Rabata. Rimandola Beke, and the rabble, Sandara, Rabaha, Satara. Rindola Bosu, Rimanda, Rabaha, Satara. In the name of Jesus, sickness be gone. Depression be gone. Those nightmares be gone. That pain be gone. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every stronghold shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Your name is power. Your name is power. healing. Your name is life. Every stronghold be broken. Break every stronghold. Oh, yes. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Now, here's what you've got to recognize, church. When you get ready to advance, the devil's going to see if you mean business. When David spouted off to Goliath and said, I'm going to take your head off. This day, I'm going to whoop you. That's the Oklahoma version of it. And it says that Goliath, when he heard that, advanced towards David. And what did David do? He ran towards Goliath. He said, you have messed with the wrong boy now. You have messed with the wrong one now. You thought I was just talking. I ain't talking. I'm doing. And I am going to take you apart. The odds were against him. All he had was a little slingshot, a few small stones. He said, I know that it's not by might nor by power, but it is by God's spirit. And he let that first ballistic missile rock go, and it struck Goliath. And let me tell you, I don't think it killed Goliath. It knocked him down. I think that David went up there. Well, I know he did. He got up there. He took Goliath's own sword. And I don't know. I don't have any Bible for this, but it's just the Steven Spielberg coming out of me. I can just see David standing on the chest of that big old giant. And at that moment, that giant's eyes opened up. And he looked at David and said, oh, no, as that sword was come. And David took Goliath. I mean, David knew how to get ahead. (laughs) 
Now, do you know what he did with that head? Anybody read the rest of the Bible, the story? You know what he did? He took that head and they posted it. They put it on the wall. So when anybody comes and say, wait a minute, isn't that Goliath? Isn't that that giant? Isn't that that one that intimidated the entire army of Israel? And that one little boy named David took him down? And what was that? That was a reminder to the enemy that would come. You don't want to mess with this bunch. How many of you, God's given you victories in your life? I'm going to mess with you now. It is by the power of your testimony that will intimidate the devil from coming back again. When you are silent about what God has done in your life, you are giving the devil ground to come into your life. But when you will post the victory of God, that you have defeated that one, and you defeated that one, and you defeated that one, and you boast of the goodness of God and the praise of God, it is the power of that praise and the power of that testimony. And I got Bible for it. For it says they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. If you begin to declare what God has done in your life, you'll open the door for what God will do in your life, and it will bring intimidation to the enemy that will stop him because he recognizes that it's not you, it's what's in you. And you'll walk around like a valiant warrior. And you'll be one of Jesus' homeboys. You really ought to study that. I don't have time. You really ought to read that whole chapter. Then just do a little study on Benaiah. Find out who he was. And how he played all the way to the end of David. He was loyal to David. When, when they tried to overthrow David's kingdom and they wouldn't put Solomon in place. And Solomon's stepbrother was trying to step in there. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let Benaiah be in there. I don't have time to get in that story, but read it. Let me just, just, it's, a great, it's a great story. God wants to use you, church. God wants to use you. Don't let the devil tell you you can't. Yes, I can. Don't let the devil tell you you're defeated. No, I'm not. Don't let the devil tell you it'll never. Yes, it will. I, I, I know that my God is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above, I can ask or think. I know he's able to keep that which I've entrusted unto him. And you walk as the valiant warrior that Benaiah was. Let that same spirit rise up in you to see the enemy defeated. Amen? Amen? Come on, give the Lord a shout one more time. Now, before we go, I want to pray for tonight. This is going to be one of the largest outreaches that we have done. It has the potential of that, but let me tell you what's going to make the potential a reality is you inviting, calling, posting on your Facebook, reposting what we've already posted. But I want to see tonight that stadium filled with people that we celebrate this great country. I thank God for the United States of America. And we're, we're going to celebrate it. I, just, I want to read, read one thing. Can, can I just read one thing? I'm going to read it anyway. I don't care if you say I can or not. It just, i got to find it here because I hadn't planned on doing this. So give me just a second. Give me just a minute. Where is that at? It's, it's right there. It's in that file, and it's right here. Okay. All right. Come on. <coughs> Come on. <coughs> oh, it's downloading. Bring me some water. See, the devil don't want me to read this. This is a bit of history for you. In 
John Adams, <clears throat> this is John Adams, one of our founding fathers. And people often talk about separation of church and state. Let me read you what John Adams said should happen on the 4th of July. He wrote this to his wife, Abigail. He says, Independence Day will be the most epic in the history of America. Independence Day will be the most uh, memorable epic in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. He said, I, I, know where the, I know how we got where we are. It's because of what God did for us. And if we take that away from this celebration, we've missed it. He said, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns. <laughs> All the Second Amendment fans out there. Guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. That's fireworks from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration. Now remember, this is before the war. This is when they signed the declaration. This is before they had beaten Great Britain. This is when they threw down the gauntlet and said, we're gonna fight. He said, but this is going to be a day that we will remember. This is going to be a day we're going to celebrate. This is going to be a day from generations to come. People will have parades and they'll shoot off fireworks and we'll remember this what God brought us here. See, he had 4th of July before there was a 4th of July. He says, I'm well aware of the toll, the blood, and the treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more than worth all the means, and that the posterity would triumph in the days of transaction, even though we should rue it, which I trust in God, we shall not. He said, in other words, we're going to win this thing. He, he shouted before the victory. He celebrated before the victory. John Adams knew to do that. Joshua knew to do that around the walls of Jericho. Why don't you just walk around today with a shout of victory on your lips? Yeah, but I'm in the middle of the battle. So is John Adams. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the middle of victory here. See, some of y'all don't know that the victory's already been won. Okay, let me, now I'm going to tell you one more thing. Then, then I'll pray and we'll go because you got to get ready for tonight. This, so, Declaration of Independence. Let's go to another dark time in our history. Really, it was the end of a dark time at the Declaration, the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln that slavery had ended. We made that declaration. Slavery is ended in our country through a civil war that we fought against each other to say slavery is wrong. Slavery is ended. But just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Juneteenth. Do you know what Juneteenth is about? Because from the time of the Declaration, the Emancipation Proclamation, it took a time throughout the states that there were still pockets, still places that slavery was still in, in, in force. And it, and it took until literally months later, until there in June, I think it was June the 17th, in, Aust in uh, Galveston, Texas, that the final slaves received the word. Because there were slave owners that were doing everything they could to hang on to those slaves. And, the, and we sent federal troops there because they heard they were still keeping slaves down in Galveston. You can't do that. And the federal troops moved into Galveston and told those slave owners, you can't do this anymore. These people are free. And you can't hold them this way any longer. Now, here's, here's my point in telling you that bit of history here. 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, Jesus purchased our freedom by his blood. But sadly, there are people that are still living in the slavery of sin. 
because the enemy is not going to let them go because they, they are his slaves and they are doing his bidding. God is looking for valiant soldiers, valiant warriors that will march up to the, to the devil himself and say, you got to let these people go. They don't belong to you. They've been bought by the blood of Jesus. They are not slaves. They are to be free indeed. Come on, somebody help me right now. And that's why we're the Liberation Army. We're the freedom fighters. We're to set the captive free. So don't ever think that it's about you, friends. That's what John Adams was talking about. And that's what we're going to do tonight. Let me pray over tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord God, that everything tonight will go according to your will, to your plan. Guide us and direct us that truly this will be a celebration of this great country, but most of all, the celebration of what you're going to do in the lives of people tonight. Fill that place with those that are hungry for you, both the church and the lost, God, that tonight all will come to give glory to you, that souls will be saved, lives transformed, the church energized by your power, that truly once again will return to one nation under God. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen. God.